let's uh, go to the next tab and so all of our data are linked in here so here's the raw data in red for each condition and what we're going to do is compute values in the margins okay the, so the easiest one to do to start with is the mean so we'll just compute the mean right here so the mean for condition a1 is 10.0 the mean for condition 2 is 10.6 and the mean for condition 3 is 16.20 the next thing that would make sense to do in terms of computations would be to calculate the sums of squares for each of the conditions now again remember i've said this all semester but when we say sum of squares what we really mean is sum of squared deviations okay so i'm going to take the mean and i'm going to subtract it uh, from each uh, score within each condition so the mean for condition a1 is 10. i'm going to subtract 10 from 10 i get zero i subtract 10 from 6 i get negative 4. this should all be familiar to you because we did this at the beginning of the course because the sum of these deviations will always be zero we're going to square each deviation score and then sum the squared deviations so the sum of squares for condition a1 is 40 for condition a2 is 21.2 and for condition a3 is 138.80 when we sum all of these sum of squares we get what's called sum of squares within so if you just go across this row right 40 plus 21 plus 20 plus uh, 138.80 is 200 okay so that's our second computation little n is just the number of observations within the condition for so for a sub 1 it's 5 a sub 2 it's 5 and a sub 3 it's 5 there's an equal n across conditions you don't have to have that by the way for ANOVA you can have different numbers of observations within each condition it'll still work just fine um, but uh, usually for sake of for the sake of demonstration you're going to have an equal n and then t is the sum of all the scores within each condition so 10 plus 6 plus 14 plus 12 plus 8 okay that's going to be 50. we sum up these observations scores, we get 53 we sum here we get 81. the sum of all the t's is going to be g okay so the sum of the total scores becomes the grand total or g that's why it's called g grand total the sum of all the baby n's the little n's within condition is is capital n 15 okay and then k equals three that's the number of groups so we have a sub one that's group one group two is a sub two group three is a sub three k equals three the last thing that really we should be calculating in the margins then is sum of squares total and to do this the first part of the equation says sigma x squared what that means is sum up all the squares of the x values okay so here are our x's right these are our raw scores so i would uh, square 10 i'd get 100 i'd square 6 i'd get 36 and so forth and i do that for all 15 scores right so when we sum all those squares together we're going to get 2574 okay so that's the first part and then the next part is we've got to get g squared over n well g is 184 so we're just going to square 184 and then we're going to divide by n that's 15 when we divide 184 squared by 15 we get 2257.07 we subtract that then from the sum of all the x's squared and our total sum of squares sum, total sum of squares or sum of squares total that becomes 316.93 and we put that right there okay okay so now we have sum of squares total which is 316.93 we have sum of squares within which is 200 uh, because sum of squares total is just the partition of within and between sum of squares all we have to do is um, uh, subtract sum of squares within from sum of squares total and we've created the partition for sum of squares between so 200 plus 116.93 equals 316.93 we've now accounted for all of the variability in the data set okay we've also filled in this first column in the ANOVA table so we just transfer over sum of squares between into the first row of the ANOVA table and then within to the second row and then total below the, the last thing we really have to do here before we can calculate the F ratio is to get degrees of freedom for degrees of freedom total within and between as you know the uh, degrees of free freedom total is just n minus 1 so n equaled 15 we subtract one we get 14 we're going to enter that down here in the ANOVA table 
Okay, now degrees of freedom between and degrees of freedom within have to sum to 14 in this case. Okay, how do we get degrees of freedom within? Okay, we're going to um, take our capital N, right, which is 15. We're going to subtract the number of groups, which is K. That's 15 minus 3 equals 12. Okay, and then our degrees of freedom between is going to be the number of groups, 3 minus 1. So 2. So we sum those together, and it's 2 plus 12 equals 14. And we talked a lot in class about why we use those particular calculations for um, calculating degrees of freedom. So if you're not clear on that, why don't you go back into the slides and where uh, we actually kind of walk through that. Okay, or just come by during office hours. We can talk about it some more. Um, but what's really important is just to understand how those are calculated and how they enter into the uh, ANOVA table. Okay, so now what we've got to do is get the computation for mean squares. Mean squares is ANOVA speak for variance. So what we're going to do to get mean squares between is we're going to take our sum of squares between 116.93 divided by 2. That ends up being 58.47. And then we're going to do within squares uh, variance, or mean squares within. And that's going to be 200 my, uh, divided by 12 equals 16.67. Now to get the actual F ratio, we're simply going to divide 58.47 by 16.67. That gives us 3.51. That's our F ratio. Now what we would do if we were you know, working through a Wawa problem or homework assignment or something like that is we would take that 3.451, I'm sorry, 3.51, we'd compare it to the critical value that we would look up in an F distribution table. We'd index sum of squares between, sum of squares within, we'd find what that F crit value was. If the F ratio is greater than the F crit value, then we would reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so um, the F ratio here may or may not be statistically significant. I haven't looked up F crit, so I'd, I don't know, but uh, that's how we do it. If it was statistically significant, then what we would do is we would um, calculate our effect size and then from that move into calculating or determining where the statistically significant differences in mean occurred, in the condition means occurred. Just looking at the data up here in this row, for the means, I can tell you that this one really pops out, right? 16.20. Doubt there's a difference between these two means, but this is probably where we would, would see the mean. We can't tell just by looking at the means, obviously, because we have taken into account the variability within the conditions. And let's talk a little bit more about that issue right now, okay? So here's some data where um, there's very little variability within each of the conditions. In fact, for A1, there is no variability. For A2, there's just a wee bit of variability right there. And for A3, there's absolutely no variability. Okay, so the within treatment or within group variability is really, really tiny. What that means is when you're calculating the F ratio, the denominator is really, really tiny. So even though these means, right, between conditions don't look like they're big differences, Look at the size of that F ratio. Came out to 76. Okay, what that means is because there's such small variability within group, really any difference in means is going to show up as a statistically significant result. And this is a, a monstrous F ratio. Okay, now look what happens as I begin to introduce more variability into the within group context. So look here, there's zero variability here, right? So if I change this one value to a six and I introduce variability within groups, it's not going to change the mean much, but watch what happens to the F ratio. So I change that to a six, dropped in half down to 30.5. Now let's say I introduce another six. Watch the F ratio. Now down to 19.2. Okay, let's say I introduce a 4. I'll really amp up the within group variability. Okay, I drop that down to a 4. Now we're down to 13.56. See what's happening? As I introduce more within group variability, it doesn't have a huge effect on these means, but it is, it is um, introducing variability within conditions. So I'll drop this down to a 5. Watch the F ratio. Down to 10. Drop this to a 4 down to six. Okay, I'll increase the mean a little bit by putting an eight here. Or how about a nine? Let's try a nine. Okay, that's going to increase my mean. 
I wonder what effect it's going to have on the F ratio, though. Now it's down to 2.77. Okay, so we've really dropped the size of that F ratio as we made more variability within groups. That denominator and the F ratio got bigger. The mean differences didn't really change that much. So all we're doing is increasing the denominator, holding the numerator of the F ratio pretty much constant, and that drop the F ratio quite a bit. Now we're at a point where we're getting to a point where uh, it's getting less and less likely that there is a statistically significant difference between these means. There's, there's, you know, we're just not seeing enough variability in the means of the conditions to reject the null uh, hypothesis. Okay, anyways, hopefully that was helpful to help demonstrate the relationship between uh, between group variability and within group variability and that this all makes sense. If you ever have any questions, please make sure to come by during office hours or email me or text me or send smoke signals, okay? So, um, good, yeah, I think that's pretty much it.